Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thanks indeed. So, firstly, I'm just going to call up the panelists who will be debating this very important issue with me. Let me start with uh, Jay Naidu. Jay Naidu, could you please come up? He is a very well-known activist and a trade unionist. He's involved in a lot of things. I give a, a round of applause for Jay Naidu, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Let me also welcome Mark Haywood. Mark Haywood, also another very well-known activist. He's with Section 27. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Fantastic. As well as Fatima Hassan. Fatima Hassan is with the Open yeah. Fo Society Foundation. Fatima, thank you very much. A big round of applause for Fatima. Fatima, thank you. Thanks again. Um, so the, the discussion at this point is about the media, civil society, and public activism. And it's interesting that uh, John has been talking about BLF, and maybe something that relates to you, uh, Jay, is, you know, Jay and Kosatu always say an injury to one is an injury to all. And I realized that today, because I was doing my show from Cape Town, and I came here pretty late. Everyone was already here, and I was alone out there when I was attacked by the BLF. <laughs> so I was walking past uh, Andile, and Andile says to me, Hey, hey, why now? Why now you, you, you allowed lies on your show about me? You are a fascist. And naturally, when I got here, I googled the word fascist again. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because, I, <laughs> quite honestly, I wanted to check whether the meaning has changed ever since the last time I was there. It's like, me, fascist? Andile. Anyway. So, but, but you see, the point about it, Jay, is that it's not a joke. The issue is, I say that he's attacking the media, but he says that he is doing uh, public activism. That's his argument. His argument is that he, he has a point, and it's, a, it's public activism. What would you say to that? Well, Tolani, I mean, you were attacked by the whole 15 people that he had behind him. <laughs> That's a serious attack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think in the time that we live in, <clears throat> a lot of talk about fake news. Mm. We also have fake activism. Mm. You know, uh, the one distinct differentiator I make between a good organizer and a bad organizer in the days when we really built social movements, uh, was uh, the loudest voice in the room, the demagogue that urged urgent you know, action that would inevitably get people killed, was the one I trusted the least. Mm. So, you know, in these times of, uh, of this type of activism that we see, I think that it, it is very dangerous. And as much as we talk about state capture and business capture, certain parts of civil society are captured. And they reflect the interests of those who fund them. And I think we must accept that. You know, they have a right to do what they are doing within the, the ambit of what are the rules of our constitution. But we mustn't be intimidated by that. You know, I've seen many such attacks on us in those past days. And really, they couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery. So <laughs> for me, I say, well, thank you very much. You're entitled to your opinion. Move yeah. on now. You know, let's get down to the serious work and the agenda of fixing up our country that is, uh, is messed up now because of the people that fund it. Fake activism, says Jay. Uh, Fatima, maybe let me bring you in here as well. Uh, do you see it as fake activism? That's one. Because sometimes, because of our history and because of what we know, we think that activism has got to take the shape that we know. Until is going to say, well, actually, I'm fighting online, I'm everywhere, I, I am following. So he has a different way of activism. So do you also consider it to be fake activism? So firstly, I just want to do, uh, reassure everybody that I'm not the bishop from the SACC. I'm a the cat last, got us confused. Yes, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a last minute stand in for the bishop because he fell ill. Um, so I do apologize if you were expecting no to worries, have the bishop no here. Uh, I think I was asked by Branko to be on the panel because they realized there were no women on the panel. And I know that this is Cape Town. <laughs> Uh, I That's know important. that this is Cape Town, and so I've, I've, I've really had a late night call with Branko fighting with him to say that uh, even though you're in this particular city, the demographics of our panel shouldn't necessarily match uh, the, the very serious race transformation uh, issues that we need to deal with, and I hope that next year this panel will include the young black African women uh, that make up civil society and the, sure. and the media space. Very valid point. Uh, <coughs> and maybe Jay, Mark, and myself, who are all very old, 
and who <laughs> grew up during a very close society, which, which we call apartheid, uh, will hang up our gloves and actually pass the baton then to the next generation. I think that's, mm. that's something that's very close to, to my heart and, and I'm sure to many people here in this room. Mm. So I would argue that uh, it's no laughing matter and it's not, you can call it fake, I, I would call it sinister. And I would call it sinister because it's something that is a pattern and a trend that is emerging in multiple countries at the same time. Mm. In fact, I think we are about two to three years behind the curve mm. uh, of what, what is a very sinister attack on the very fabric and the foundation of democratic traditions and societies. Mm. It's unfortunate that we having to now uh, deal with this and respond to this in this particular uh, very digitally disruptive uh, social media type of climate. Yeah. We, for example, do work in countries such as Hungary, such as Russia, India, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. And this is the precursor to attempts to totally close down the space uh, within which civil society can organize and assemble, and mm. also the space in which the media can report freely, fairly, independently, without the risk of physical intimidation, harassment, but also very critically uh, political interference and censorship, and maybe later in the panel we'll be able to talk through some of those issues. So I I'm normally called a pessimist and, a, and, and somebody who's very cynical, but today I want to warn that this is something that we're seeing in the playbook mm. of governments that are not uh, supportive of the fact that civil society globally and the media globally, and by that I mean an independent, non-commercial media that is mm. not politically or commercially captured, is shining a spotlight mm. on abuses of power both of government players but also of private sector players. And maybe we can talk about sure. uh, what our media and civil society is doing to expose some of the most egregious abuses of human rights currently taking place in this country, mm. uh, which are being carried out by mining companies. Wow, no, there's just so much to think about there. Uh, but just to go back to the point you made around, and I'm gonna come back to the undelay issue and the media, et cetera, but the point about representation in this panel, and again, I'm still with you, Fatima, if you don't mind. Um, and it actually just shows what is happening in society because there are so many things happening at once that we tend to jump issues. Perhaps we've forgotten so much about the need to, uh, for instance, uh, make sure that we empower women, we empower black people, so we're busy chasing now issues of corruption and we've forgotten about other issues simply because of what's happening in society, which may mean that it's important to have civil society organizations that are focusing on different parts of uh, th those issues. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it has to be simultaneous. And, you know, in our country, it's the issue of race and gender that has to be addressed head on. We can't claim legitimacy and credibility until we actually deal with those issues, while we also focus on the issue of the need to have investigative journalism, on the need to be able to have white journalists not to have their identity numbers and their addresses being put on the internet. Mm. In other countries, ethnicity is used. The attacks on the media in those countries is that there's not enough of one particular ethnicity or not enough of one particular type of language speaking group. So it is very sinister. I think that there are those of us who are progressive enough that when we bring into the debate the issue of transformation, we coming from a position which is rooted in our constitution, mm. which is rooted in the need to be cognizant of our past and the need to mentor and transfer skills to the next generation. Mm. I think the, the group of people who were outside this morning and a lot of us experienced that and encountered that, theirs is, is, is not a genuine interest in transformation. Theirs is not a genuine interest in a transformative civil society and a transformative media. But that doesn't mean that that issue is not something that we should address in a progressive, in a constitutional, and in a, in a, in a very respectful uh, manner. And I don't think there's anybody in this room or on this panel who doesn't agree with the need to transform civil society and the media. Yeah. My appeal is that we need to now deal with this with a sense of urgency. Mm. It's almost 25 years. Mm. I think you know, the, what people call the honeymoon period is, I th for me, definitely over. Mm. Mark, let me bring you in. Um, Section 27, part of Section 27 is the TAC, and the TAC, this side of democracy, is possibly the most successful or has done the most successful organization. 
What has been the relationship between the TAC, Section 27, and the media like? But also, how do you see the space generally of that activism, public uh, activism? Well, I think the first thing I want to say is that, you know, the success of our constitutional vis vision depends upon activism. And it depends upon radical, unapologetic, loud activism. Activism that demands constitutional rights, that exposes corruption, and that says that this original idea of equality and social justice must be made a real idea. And in the work that you know, we do as TAC and as Section 27, we spend our days staring state failure in the face. You know, you go to the schools of Limpopo where there are still 88,000 kids who have to use pit toilets, mm -hmm. where we'll be going to court in a couple of months' time over that little boy, Michael Kamapi, who yes. drowned in a toilet. You go to the free state where 25% of doctors have left the public health care system because of mismanagement of the public health care system. And what I want to say about that in relation to the media is that, you know, I think a critical responsibility on the media is to join the dots between state capture and state failure. You know, I, I sat in the treasury <laughs> around the big boardroom the day after Praveen and company had been fired. And Praveen said, join the dots, join the dots, join the dots. Mm. And the media has done a lot to join those dots. We now have a picture mm. of state capture. But where I think the media is failing us is to say, what are the consequences of state capture? And that is where you get into the terrain of state failure. So let me give you one, two examples, Kalani, and then I'll, I'll shush. But as we sit here now, mm. the National Health Laboratory Services sits with a debt of 7 billion rand. It needs 800 million rand yep. immediately so that it doesn't collapse by November, December. 70% of clinical decisions in our public health system are dependent on a HIV test result or a TB test result or this result or that result. Mm. But nobody's drawing that picture. So we, we're looking at the ESCOMs, we're looking at the transnets, and so we should. Can I but just we're say not looking thing. at these other Can places. Can I just say one thing? I did the story this morning. I'm very <laughs> glad to hear that. And I can tell you, one of the things that came out, actually I spoke to the professor, the acting CEO this morning, one of the things that came out is that the Department of Health, Gauteng, owes the National Health Laboratory Systems two and a half two billion. Two and a half billion rand. And, but that's why I'm saying journalism has such a critical role to play, because sometimes journalism has a short memory so why is it that Brian Tlongwa is still the speaker, I think, of the Gauteng legislature when he started the stealing? You know, we've got this accumulation of debt in sure. places like the NHLS. Sure. And what it does is the consequences are on the poor. It turns the conditions of the poor worse and worse. Let me give you another example. I mean, I mentioned the, the free state. You know, you guys focus correctly on Minister Zwani mm. because of what he's doing, trying to destroy the mining industry. Yeah. Before Zwani came to uh, the national department, mm. he was MEC, I think, for agriculture sure. in the free state. Zwani was the character who got his friend Benny Malakwane mm. to jump the queue at Ditlebeng Hospital to mm. kick out a patient in ICU so that he could have his relative put into that bed mm. at, the cost of, at the cost of a life. We, we've got to see the whole picture. We've got to see the human dimensions mm. of this crisis, the human cost of this crisis. Because if we don't do that, Kalani, we will not galvanize our society to really stand up for the constitutional vision and on behalf of the dispossessed and on behalf of the poorest of the poor. And then we will have a spread of state failure throughout the country which will make Andile and Company's campaign a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's when states fail that you have the grounds and the seeds laid mm. for populism, for mm. civil war, for mm. violence against each other. Sure. So just see both parts of the equation. Fair point, but Jay, let me bring you in here because some may argue that essentially what Mark wants us to do as the media to, is to be also activists. Yes. Where <laughs> he wants us to do what he, civil society is supposed to do. So where does journalism begin and end and where does the NGOs, civil society then pick up or you know, is it all kind of related? You know, let's, let's <clears throat> redefine the, the landscape of media. You know, every single one of us sitting in this room is uh, potentially a journalist. That's we true. are going to 
go on social media, we're going to analyze what we are receiving as information, and we're passing forward our, our view on that, the, on that substance. Mm. So the media landscape is completely transformed, you yeah. know, and, and the age of the internet is, is a revolution that mm. has completely upturned the way we live, the way we organize, the way we communicate, the way we access services, and fundamentally the, the nature of production. We have to understand this work. I spent a lot of time in the last decades with young people. What are they concerned about? You know, and, and this is where I think there's a disjuncture between where civil society is, like people like me who come from a, a previous century, and still think we are relevant and understand everything about what young people want today. Mm. What young people are concerned about today? They're concerned about the fact that in three lifetimes, we will not be able to live on this planet because of our human greed, yeah. that we will be committing ecocide that 70% of our forests are already gone. That means we wouldn't be able to breathe, mm. that we're polluting our water, we mm. won't be able to live without water, that our soils, 40% of the soils are already gone. They are so chemically poisoned that you cannot grow food. And if you look at it in a broader scale, we're almost close to 50% of species that are now extinct, and they say, we are now in what we call the sixth extinction, which is caused by us. There's been five other extinctions. And at 75%, the human species dies and everything living. That's what they're concerned about. They're concerned about a technological revolution where robotics, where nanotechnology, where, where artificial intelligence is fundamentally changing the nature of work. That we are on the cusp of driverless cars, the biggest taxi company in the world, which many of us use, is Uber. They don't own a single taxi. Mm. The biggest hotel group is Airbnb. They don't own a hotel. They are concerned about jobs. They are concerned about feeding themselves, of having the hope and dignity. And so I look at it and think, but we're still locked in our own minds, our old paradigms, which are a bit archaic. We're like dinosaurs trying to have a rebirth. Mm. And I think that activism today we see in our country. This is the protest capital of the world. And all the time you have interventions that come from the top. I love them and I support them and I think we must challenge state uh, capture. But real work about building activism that we experienced in the 80s is hard work. It's learning to shut your mouth and listen to people. Mm. They know more about the problems they have and more about the solutions. It's about co-creating visions, about strategy, about tactics. It's about the tools that they need. It's about empowering people in the real sense. What do NGOs do today? They think a weekend workshop teaching people how to farm, suddenly people have livelihoods in agriculture. It's nonsense. Mm. So it's all, they think signing a digital petition is great work. I'm now an activist. How many likes I have on Facebook? I don't see a single country in the world run by Twitter or Facebook. So it's about understanding that this social media is a tool, it's not an end. Mm. So that type of activism requires a complete rethink. And we're not there, we're not discussing that. And we're not capturing the imagination of the turbulence of people on the ground who are fed up. Mm. They're fed up with us in this room. They don't trust us. Just as much as they don't trust government. We have a breach of trust in this, in this country and in the world. We're not unique. We are, this is what I experience across the world. So we've got to rethink activism, media, and how we work with people in a way in which we build accountability sure. and governance. I just wonder if Mark will agree with you on this issue of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, more than welcome. <clears throat> of, uh, on this issue of digital petitions. And by the way, just yesterday, I think it was the DA that, uh, that spoke about a million people who have signed their digital petition, which some people say is an achievement, um, uh, given the fact that it was only, I think, uh, th when the UDF was formed and they were, they were fighting against the tricameral parliament, they were able to get about a million people. So if young people are concerned about what's happening on the internet, then that's where we should find them, through digital uh, petitions. Mark? Yeah, look, I agree and I, d I don't <laughs> agree. <You> know, <laughs> um, uh, where I agree with Jay is that there is no substitute when you talk about activism yeah. for activism that has served human beings throughout the whole of human history, which is one person talking to another person, mm. persuading another person, giving a person information, organizing together, identifying something that must change, and then going out and making that change. Yeah. 
Facebook and Twitter may be fantastic, but they're impersonal. They don't get, they don't get to your heart mm. very often. Mm. They help people to get from this seat to that seat to press a button, mm. but they don't always, not uh, entirely, but they don't always get people out on the street. They don't give people the level of information that they need to make informed decisions about how and why we should fight. But let me just say one other thing, Kodani, which is, there, Jay's right, but he's wrong as well. There is a lot of good activism still going on mm. in communities mm. across the country, in rural areas. The problem is, if it's not seen, people don't think it exists, which again, for me, is about the role of media, because media doesn't tell whole stories mm. a lot of the time. Sure. There are so many heroes and heroines in our country who fight on a day-to-day -day basis against inequality, against the abuse of power at local, at provincial, at national level. We don't know the names of those people. We only know the names of the big players mm. in the big game, mm. which is why, you know, to answer your question, you say, I want the media to also be activists. I, I do want the media to also be activists. And I don't think there's a contradiction between an activist media and a professional media, mm. activist media and an ethical media, activist media and an independent media. Because in this country, you are lucky, you've got your own constitutional protection. Sure. Section 16 says, you know, we have a right to a free press. We have a right to impart information ideas. I'll defend you any day of the week but you must also help to defend the communities. You have also a role to play in advancing this vision of social justice and you equality. See, it's interesting, Fatima, and coming on that one, because uh, the, the point Mark is making is very interesting. In, in the 80s, right, during apartheid, it was black and white. You were either, for instance, the Sowetan. You go to the Sowetan, you knew what you were going to find. The activism was there. It was clear, daily nation and whatever. George Lolo will tell you about it. But perhaps it's slightly different now. It's not as black and white as it was back then, even though obviously there are challenges, but it's a completely different dis dispensation. Yeah, I mean, I think the, well, I wouldn't underestimate the reach of Facebook and Twitter in what is considered a global cyber war against progressiveness, for want of a better word. So in South Africa, we'll talk about constitutionalism, but globally, it's about progressive values. So the increase in fake sites, false narrative, uh, misinformation, disinformation, using Facebook and Twitter as means and mechanisms to actually access younger audiences with propaganda. Mm. So I don't believe there's a word such as fake news. There's either news or there's false information or mm. propaganda. Mm. And, and I think that we, we should stay clear from this narrative of fake news because it gives credence to people who actually don't believe in correct information mm. that they don't necessarily like. And just on that, I mean, I think, you know, I, I saw one of our country's most important whistleblowers enter the room a few minutes ago. Um, and, and I think that we haven't talked about whistleblowers, but the point about that Mark made about a, a state that is captured and a state that is weak. The Mail and Guardian uh, a few years ago reported that most of the whistleblowers' reports that they received were from people working in government. And so I think the connection between a resilient civil society, uh, whistleblowers within the state, whistleblowers within Vodacom, please put your hand up, mm. whistleblowers within the corporate sector, to be able to tell the media a story that is fact-checked, that is verified, that has multiple sources, that, I think, is sort of the project that we have to be working on in an extremely difficult climate globally where disinformation has become par for the cause. Now, what we were dealing with 20 years ago, I think, is very different to what we're dealing with now. And if there's a way we can use Facebook and Google and Twitter, and I think uh, Luke is, is speaking later today, then I think that those, those means have to be used because I think there's an underestimation Mm. of what has happened in our rural areas. So we work with about 96 organizations around the country. And what we're hearing is very different to what you hear at the CTICC. People are using their mobile phones. Yes, they're spending a lot for data and they're being exploited, but they're using their mobile phones. There is mobile penetration in this country of younger people, particularly, and of old gogos, 
And that's how that Sasa crisis was actually unfolded. And you can use technology and the digital disruption in a way that is progressive and creative to ensure that people get the correct information. I think we're not losing the war on propaganda, but we could. Mm. And the only thing we can do is, mm. you can't change somebody. You can't change a propagandist view. You can't change the view of the policeman who's now retired, who's gone to the Timor inquest to basically say he still doesn't remember. You, you'll never get him to understand sure. what we're trying to do. But what you can do is put out correct information. And information that is, and we haven't talked about it as yet, uh, we've talked about the political capture, we've talked about political interference from Saxon World or the New Age or N7, but we haven't talked about commercial uh, interference which leads to self-censorship. Songhezo Zibi's open resignation letter, yeah. which he published, talked about self-censorship in commercial houses. Th so in, that's so, true. So my that's last point mm. on, on what Mark said about, uh, you know, that the media have to be activists as well. If you look what courage it took for the SABC 8 and they now SABC 7 because of the, of, of the very sort of tragic and unfortunate passing of Sune, you know, that is what we need in commercial media houses as well. You know, the activism is not just about the stories you write. The activism is about calling it out, about calling out Media 24 and Huffington Post for not appealing that appalling, appalling sure. ruling on hate speech. I'm going to come to you, Jay, in a moment. But I just I want to follow up on what Mark was saying, because he says we don't see some of the stories happening in our community. The reality, and you would know this, is that good journalism is expensive, and the media is no longer what it used to be. Uh, the media doesn't make as much money as it used to make simply because of the advent of um, the internet, etc., etc. How then do we balance all of these? Because there are commercial imperatives plus what Mark wants. Okay, you want to you respond? Well, can, yeah, yeah, and I'll be very brief. Just to say that I think that people like us in civil society should be doing more to fight for media, for professional journalism and journalis journalists, and for the resources that are needed for the media, because media plays a crucial role in our democracy and in sustaining our democracy, just as we should be fighting more money for civil society organizations, because you've all seen now mm. the role that has been played by a black sash or a right to know or a TAC in these critical days, the role that has been played by a daily maverick. So that's part of the discussion that we should be having and was happening earlier on when we had Sipo and company Wendy up here, mm -hmm. what is the role in business? Business sits there merrily business as usual while the, the media is starved and suffocated and unable to play the, the role that the Constitution envisages. But you see, it. it's a very dicey situation because whilst, whilst we know Mark is good, is a good activist and I'll take money from Mark, there is also somebody else who is an activist and who would want to pay for me would, with completely malicious intent. So, so it's important. Yes, you, you can you know, mobilize people to, to start supporting journalism, but people will support it for different intentions. While yours may be good, others may be malicious so that you destroy the very good journalism. But surely you can set standards and criteria to evaluate what is journalism that aims at excavating mm. real truth and real facts. Mm for a social mm, sure. good and journalism so, that is what do you want to say funded to yeah. advance a hidden agenda. Sure. You know, I think, the, first of all, let me clarify. I, I think <laughs> this country is bubbling with activism mm. at a very grassroots level. There is tremendous anger, and if I was living in a township now, I would be as angry as them. 56% of, of young people coming out of 12 years of education, have very few skills, unlikely to have a job, a formal job in their lifetime. And they are angry about it. And so that anger is bubbling into, into actions that often involves burning down a building. Yeah. Because that's the only way they're going to get attention mm. of someone. Now, when that happens, when violence becomes a language, we are in serious trouble. When it starts to happen in our universities, we're even deeper trouble. So really, we've got to accept that we're in a crisis. Not just a crisis of governance and state capture. We're in a crisis as a society. And we've got to find a way in which we go back to the basics of how we organize. So I think that's the first thing. I think there's tremendous activism that is taking place in the country. And we need to find a way in which we support that as elders, as other people that have, and business people in media, etc. Yeah. The second point, social media is a very important tool. I'm not denying that. Yeah. But it's not an end on itself. No. And that's what we have to clarify. The third thing is that the media cannot be neutral. 
in times of crisis. And we're not asking you to manufacture facts. We want you to work on facts. But it's like having someone who says, I can't, I have, you, you know, he's a climate denialist. Climate change does not exist. When the science across the world is saying in three lifetimes, we don't have a world to leave to our grandchildren. That's the science. Now you want to stay, oh no, I need to be a independent, so I've got to have a climate denialist mm. and then someone who's talking about climate change. It almost takes us back to the HIV AIDS yeah. time. Mm. We'll assemble a panel to look at HIV AIDS, but we'll bring some of the top denialists of HIV into the panel. This is the crisis we are here. The crisis is also an opportunity. Mm. It's an opportunity for us to rethink, to recalibrate, and this is where there is skepticism of us. Because much of the battles that happened at the top, the noise at the top is seen as battles between elites, and we are all part of those elites. You know, why suddenly we are outraged when this failure that you're talking about, Mark, has been there for two decades? Why are we suddenly standing up today? That's what young people are asking. When they face me and I have to sit down with them, I'm called a traitor. I've called that I've betrayed them alongside Mandela. That's the conversation we've got to have. Mm. Let that anger get out and acknowledge it. We made mistakes, but we also did some things that worked. And that's the conversation we've got to have, not the conversation about just Zuma must go. Of course he must go and I support those that are guilty of state capture should all go. We have to fix up the top, but more important, I say to you all, is we've got to fix up the bottom because there's a deficit of trust in everything we stand for. Mm. It's also, I wonder if it's also just a crisis of leadership across the board. Because if you think about all of these protests that we're reporting on, and by the way, we do report on these protests, eh, Mark? Mm. It may very well be about how we report on them. Um, because on a daily basis they're there, but there's no effect. What happens afterwards? We just, you know, things will be burnt down today and things will be burnt down again tomorrow. They, nothing changes. So, so what is it about? Is it about the leadership at that level or is it about a non-responsive le leadership at a higher level? Do you, what, what is it about, Mark? I think it, there's, a, there's a failure of leadership across the board, yeah. as you're saying. Mm. There's a failure of vision. There's a failure to link different professional visions to the Constitution's vision of equality and of social justice. Mm. You know, I'm being uh, critical a little bit of the media today. Fair point. Not because I am critical. I think the media's played a heroic, fantastic role and, and so important what you're all doing at the moment, but because I don't think it's enough. The same as what Fatima and, 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 and Jay are saying. You know, I think it's, it, it, it's selective, it's partial. You say that you report protests. Yes, you do report protests, but you don't have the resources to go underneath those protests to find out what it is that's bubbling. When you report something like the life Esidimeni crisis, you didn't report it beforehand when we were trying to draw, mm. uh, use the media to stop the crisis from happening afterwards. Mm. It's a sexy thing for a few weeks at the time of the Ombuds report, but the life Esidimeni crisis continues to this day. There is story, a story and stories mm. about the failure of the police to investigate, to carry out the inquests that need to take place, about the fact that there are still people sitting in places or being looked after in places they shouldn't be being looked after. Mm. You know, these stories go on and on. And I guess what I'm appealing for in terms of, of the relationship of journalism and media to activism is to try to expand the ambit of reporting in order to assist the bigger vision that we are trying to get, which is to fix sure. this state failure that is evident all around you know, us. But part of the problem, uh, Fatima, and then come in here, uh, I've got two things that I'd like to raise with you. Firstly, is it therefore um, recommended that perhaps you should be funding media that works with specific civil society organizations, like Ground Up, for instance, because they specifically work you know, in a particular area? Is that, is that a recommendable thing to do? That's one. But secondly, you've also got to understand where we are as commercial media and mainstream media, we, we get criticized from all sides of the, of the game. Mark is criticizing us fairly, but on the other hand, you know, one of the things that has happened, and it's very interesting because if you ask each and every journalist about why are they covering Andile Mutama, it's not so much because we want him, but it's because we are meant to be professional. 
to show the, both sides of the story, even though he's insulting us. So we've got other things that we need to manage um, at a professional level. Why is Anil Mutama in each and every newspaper, newscast, <laughs> even though he insults us? We do it because we have an obligation to be professional. Right? So we've got all of those obligations, all of those dynamics that we need to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would slightly disagree. I, I wouldn't give airtime to, to people who are just not giving evidence of facts and who are being um, sort of undermining the values and the ethos of the Constitution. I think there are enough people who say crazy things that you could report on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure why, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and similarly, there's, there's, you know, for every one person who says uh, these crazy things, there's about a thousand people who are saying very important things, yeah. very positive things, very progressive things, and they don't get airtime. So, so I do believe that it's the hashtag syndrome, and so let's just deal with that. I, I still can't believe, I was born on the day Ahmed Timor was killed by the apartheid police. His inquest is currently being reopened through the work of civil society, not our government, not the DA, which mm. goes to court on every other issue, but not this, not the EFF. Pro bono lawyers that are having to argue this case, okay? Uh, donors have had to come in from outside of the country to provide money so that this inquest could be reopened. Journalists who are sitting and telling us what's going on. But it's at number five or six. Some, some celebrity is trending. Some celebrity, well, actually, Nando's Gathering is trending now, number one. <laughs> um, but, but this, you know, for the last few days, I've been looking at that, and, and is, that, is that what we're being told? And, and that's why I agree, Jay, with you, that social media is just one little reflection of what's currently happening. Mm. So let me switch to the questions you've asked me. Uh, I have a problem with the way we report about protests. Media Monitoring Africa, who's actually here with us, one of our grantees, has been analyzing and monitoring trends in how commercial media and public interest media and the state media, and I define media into three groups. It's the state media and the state mouthpieces, it's, which is supposed to belong to the public, SABC, et cetera, mm -hmm. SABC radio, and we shouldn't underestimate the reach of radio. There's public interest media with the ground up, the Amabis, the Daily Mavericks, the Health Ease, the Bexisas, all of those uh, groups fit in. And then there's a the commercial media, your, your four large commercial media houses, Media 24, uh, et cetera, Business Day, Sunday Times, City Press. And, what's, and even 702, so maybe you can go back and help us. When they report on a protest and a service delivery protest of communities, and Jay's right, who have been waiting for 20 years for toilets, sanitation, water, serious issues, unemployment, uh, you know, social security grant, there is a traffic disruption on the N2. Mm. The protest coverage has become about traffic and the convenience of people who drive cars who are middle class. That's how you're reporting protests. So you're not getting to the deeper structural issues. You're not getting to the issues that Jay is talking about, about the time bomb mm. that we are sitting with mm. around a future generation mm. of people who are not going to be able to get jobs and who are saying we have material anxiety. Carl van Holt has written about this. Our violent democracy means that young people have a deep sense of material anxiety and that is leading to an escalation of both protests but also a very destructive politics. And so that I think is something all media needs to address. In my view, what's currently happening in this country and I can because we're seeing this from a sort of bigger picture of what's happening in other countries around attacks on, on media freedom and attacks on the press. And luckily, we don't have journalists sitting in jail. But just a few countries mm -hmm. across our borders, the rest of the continent, Europe, uh, if you see what Trump, uh, the Trump administration is doing, this is a very difficult, this is a very dangerous, I think, global climate. If you see what's happening in India, if you see what's happening in Russia, and we are part of BRICS and we are following the exact playbook. The, the, what I'm seeing in our assessment of what's going on is that there are people whose agenda is to tell the truth. And I say, viva your agenda, mm. tell the truth. Mm. Okay, we can't shy away from that. And there are then people whose agenda <laughs> is to make sure you don't tell the truth mm. and you don't actually connect the dots. And that is actually what we need to resist. And one way of doing that is to fund an independent media through subscriptions, through crowdsourcing, through giving donations. It can't only be left to wealthy individuals or foreign uh, you know, philanthropists to provide the funding for local independent media in South Africa. Mm. If they 
are the engine of our democracy, which mm. I believe they are, as well as civil society, then I think the argument is pretty clear. If we fund the Legal Resources Center and you believe in funding community activists in Amadiba or you know, public interest litigation related to the Timor inquest or to Marikana, then similarly you have to fund the people who are actually going to do the research and, and tell that story. Exactly. So, Funding is a difficult conversation. We've had it for the last three Maverick gatherings for the last uh, yeah, three times. The issue is that the state has a lot of resources to fund media. We're not quite clear what the MDDA is doing in relation to a large pot of money that is meant to be funding community media. Mm. So it's being left to other people to fund independent media. And more importantly, there's air diversions uh, mm. uh, that is currently undergoing, and a lot of research is being done to show where governments money which is actually our money, it's public money, that mm. should be used to fund uh, a vast array of media units is actually being diverted to specific media houses with a specific political objective where there is no editorial independence. And that is a very serious threat to our democracy. And I think um, Jay pointed out a little earlier on about um, some um, NGOs that may fund who, you know, or people who are captured who may end up funding certain newsrooms and the process, you know, getting, getting newsrooms captured as well. Could I, could I just raise the issue, you know, this again a part of an experience I had, you know, Sipo was here earlier and I remember when I was 15 years old going to listen to Steve Biko mm. with Barney Patiana being in the room. Mm. You know, the thing that really I, I got from him, and he took my idea, my anger that I felt had been robbed of my, my human dignity and made to be non-white and non-person, and in actually feeling inferior to white people. Sure. And it, he never gave us a business plan. He never gave us log frames to fit in. He never had money to give us free t-shirts. He gave us a sense of direction that we had nothing to lose but our chains. Mm. How are we inspiring people today? You know, if I look at the 80s, we actually were never led by NGOs. The idea of an NGO person walking to my office telling me as General Secretary of Kosato, and by the way, I agree with you on everything around demographics, whether it's age, race, gender. Uh, you know, I think that these platforms should have young people as compulsory components of any conversations that we are having mm. about the future of this country, because mm. they are the future of our country. That's true, that's true. So, but the thing is, the mothership has always been social movements. NGOs were feeding off the mothership. The question is, what is the mothership of the social movements in our country today? A number of them have been captured. Many of them have become conveyor belts with leadership into positions of power, whether in the corporate sector or whether in government. I think we really need to go back to the basics of what we fund. You know, I work. For the last three years, I've been working with farm workers who are still being evicted today from white-owned farms all over the country, but in the Eastern Free State. And it is not about us going there and giving them money, giving them, telling them, I'm coming here to build you a nice clinic. Because maybe they don't want a clinic. This is the way we get it wrong. We think thinking that by taking and holding out a big check and seeing that many people from the corporate sector here I think you have to rethink CSI. What is organizing? Mm -hmm. It's not just in NGOs and big campaigns. It's the, it's the hard-working, persistent work in these two villages that we're working with. When we arrived, like any village in South Africa, 90% unemployment, people hungry. And just by systematically working with people, conscientiously, today the biggest problem they have in these villages is they have no more labor left because they've got a bakery, they've got poultry operations, they've got construction, they're running a community-run lodge, they're growing their own Jeez. food. Unheard and the of. thing is, it's not rocket science. And this is not one cent of government money. Okay? People like we cashed in the pension that we had. But could we talk about real organizing, of mm. going back to the ground so that CSI doesn't, I think Wendy said, it doesn't come about kissing babies and cutting ribbons. Mm. It has to be about serious work that we have to do to help create pathways of hope and opportunity for people today who feel left behind by this democracy and will never come and sit in a place like Cape Town Convention Center. Mm. Amazing. But the uh, a big round of applause. I think that was amazing.
the fact that they've run out of labor in South Africa. Yeah. Gee, in a rural area. In a rural area. They don't have so labor. So I invite anymore. you all to come and see and go and talk to that community. If we if can Jackson replicate that a thousand times, hmm. we will build the movements of the future that will hold leaders accountable. Because no one will come there now and bullshit them by giving them a free T-shirt and a food parcel and say, I want your vote. Jeez. I hope the sound guy was able to peep that. Hey? I hope the sound guy was able to peep that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so listen, we're coming to, to an end of this session, and I'm going to take closing statements from all of you. Uh, maybe let me start with you, Fatima. So I want to talk about an Australian mining company. So we talk about uh, white monopoly capital and, and the foreigners who are coming, but there, there is a story that's unfolding which very few media has actually written about it, which very few activists are actually talking about it. And so when we, when we talk about activism, there also has to be solidarity. Mm. There has to be solidarity of the people who are reporting the story, who are getting threatened, and there has to be solidarity for the people who are resisting this company. Uh, and, and that story needs to be told and there needs to be solidarity. And so for the first time in post-apartheid South Africa, an Australian mining company has decided to serve a summons of defamation against two public interest lawyers who works for an environmental NGO and who works closely with the Amadiba Crisis Committee. Now, who here knew about this? Have you read about it? Have you seen it on social media? I think I can count maybe 15 <laughs> hands. And so, my final comment is, if there is one critique of our media, and, and this is our state media, the commercial media, and public interest media, all three different types of media, is that we do not report enough about violations of the private sector and of private companies, both based in South Africa and elsewhere. This is unprecedented. This is the stuff that should only be happening in countries which are autocratic, where they don't have democratic values. How can this be? How can it also be permissible that you do this? I mean, even in the heydays of HIV AIDS denialism, a lot of us said crazy things about pharmaceutical companies. We were never sued for defamation. We were never interdicted or stopped. And so I want to you know, give a challenge to the media here today and to everybody else, is to say, why are we not hearing the stories about the violations and the deep, deep worrying trends of the private sector in South Africa. Because if we are concerned about building a society that looks at the abuses of powers of the state, then we need to have equal vigor in holding the private sector to account. Gee, that's very important. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fatima. Mark? Yeah, I just want to pick up again and make an appeal to the media to look more deeply at what is going on at ground zero in our society. Mm. You know, things have not stood still for the last 20 years. Things are getting significantly worse in many areas of life. If you look at what is happening to our educa basic education system, the destruction of infrastructure, if you look at our health system, if you look at evidence of an epidemic of despair by the explosion of drug use in many communities, if you look at the femicide against women and against girls, that it's a horror mm. out there and we have to recognize and we have to analyze it and we have to try to mobilize against it. And sometimes the media plays a fantastic role. You know, the Becca Sisa uh, expose of Deepslut, for example, gender violence in Deepslut that mm. was in the Mail and Guardian two or three weeks ago. Mm. It was a brilliantly researched, written, powerful, important piece. And that is what a role that journalism must play. But what we've done today is focus on, and I want to finish on this point, two what Fatima called engines of our democracy, civil society and media. They're yeah. two sides of a same coin. They're both absolutely necessary. But we've also said here that both of them are struggling. In a country with resources, both of them are struggling very, very seriously. Before us, we had big business people up here pledging their commitment to our democracy, to our constitution, to a more vigorous business response to state capture, etc. They've got money. You know, they put 10 billion rand per year in corporate social investment into a lot of stuff that is very often window dressing. It doesn't get to the systemic underlying causes of the crisis that I'm, I'm describing. Sure. So what we have to say to the business community is put your hands up to start to support the work of journalists, to start to support the work of civil society. Mm. Not civil society broadly, 
but those parts of civil society that are engaged in activism and advocacy that is part of the defense and the advance of the constitutional so state. one, Mark, before I move from you, why, why do you think the media is not doing the work that you think? Is it, is it because of the money? Is it because of experience? Is it because of the change? What do you think it is? Well, from what I hear, the media, a lot of the constraints of the media are to do with the, with the growth of new forms of media, to the shift of advertising, money out of the media. Mm. That's creating a, a, a professional crisis sure. in the media. There's nobody willing to put money into somebody, apart from perhaps da Daily Maverick or Amar Bungani, who's going to spend days and days and days peering at emails <laughs> to try mm. to find truths in a mass of... Sure. A, a mass of inf in information. Mm -hmm. That is a necessary part of journalism. Unless you can rebuild that part of journalism or protect it, then we're on a slippery slope to, to, to a much weaker uh, uh, form of media. It's a complex question, but it's not <coughs> without solutions. And we, we can't just sit here and blame everybody else. The solutions are within this room. If there's one thing you can say about this room, there's a lot of money in it, <laughs> there's a lot of power in it, mm. and there's a lot of capability to fix the problems that we've been discussing. Fantastic. Jay, your closing remarks? Yeah, I, I, I think to end with a good news story, you know, one of my experiences in the last three years is that we made a decision to join the Free State Farmers Land Board. This is Jay Naidu and the community there in a province that uh, you, I think Mark confirmed is one of the failed provinces of mm. our country and where yeah. I was not allowed to stay more than 24 <laughs> hours a day. And the president, Dan <laughs> Creek, came to see me and the community. And because of our discussions, I ended up talking to the Agri-SA national executive team on land reform. Mm -hmm. And what's emerged out of that is a, a commitment to a memorandum of understanding, including the Mandela Foundation, where they will go back to their members. Beyond the whole big issue around land, about white farmers putting land on the table for farm workers that have for generations built up their wealth, mm. and, and work with them to integrate these farm worker communities into the food value chain and building livelihoods mm. in agriculture. Well, in this area where, uh, where we are working, there's at least four white farmers that have come to the table. Now, I look at it and say, if agriculture could expand as a sector of our economy, it will be a tremendous boost in tackling hunger. Because our aid memoir with them mm. it says, starts off with saying, we believe in a country where none shall go hungry. Mm. That is the starting point of why we want them to do things. Now, if we could take media into the deep you know, insides of that work that is happening, where communities are starting to do things, they are finding partners, they are trying to navigate all the complexities of our past, mm. and, and use your enterprise development, use your CSI spend, use media covering those stories, I think we need some positive news in this country, and there's lots of positive things happening sure. on the ground. Mm. Let's find a way that we don't get drowned in this negativity which mm. exists in our country mm. and find the courage to stand up today and say, we want a different South Africa. We want the South Africa of the dreams we had in 1994 to deliver a better life to the 55 million South Africans. Mm. And we have to do that by being present and committing ourselves in the trenches where people are living in poverty. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I suppose to pick up on uh, what Mark was saying, there is, um, there is a lot of, uh, I suppose, capacity in this room. People are able to do the kind of work that you say they must. They must be able to fund good journalism, and there's a need for good journalism in this country, but also good activism. Not capture us, fund us so that we are able to do the That's work right. that we are supposed exactly. to do. Uh, Fatima, I must thank you very much for coming through. Much appreciated. A big round of applause for Fatima Hassan. Thank you. Thank you to... Thank you to Mark Haywood. Thanks, Mark. Thank you to Jay Naidu. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you.